early on. Um, I know that my mom and I are both terrified of, of Border Patrol agents because of the experiences that Latino folks have, even in El Paso. Um, I have been stopped multiple times by Border Patrol um, as a child in El Paso, but also as I traveled internationally. So it's, it's a reality. Every time that I travel to serve internationally, I know that there's an opportunity that I'm going to be detained as I enter the United States and that I will spend um, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour explaining who I am, proving that I speak English, and justifying what I was doing serving dual language programs in Hong Kong or in Beijing or in Latin America or in Europe. And so that is the reality. And with so many things happening um, at this moment in time, I really felt like it was important that we had two practitioners that live and breathe um, service to their students. And so that's the reason why we're having this live webinar. I wanted to introduce you uh, first to Abelardo Almazan. And I'm not going to read all of their bio because I really want to give them a chance to um, introduce themselves. But just letting you know that it's his 10th year of teaching Spanish. He coaches um, soccer as well, teaches Latin dance at the Putney School. Um, and the way, the way in which I became familiarized with Abelardo's work is that we actually met um, at a Nectful conference and followed each other on social media. And he's an anti-bias, anti-racism expert who does what he does in the classroom and overtly um, decolonizes uh, curriculum on a daily basis. And so I'm so excited that we have him here. I also wanted to introduce Hissel. I met Hissel actually when I served in the Illinois area. Um, she is a dual language teacher. She is a DACA recipient and she is a DACA advocate badass, like badass. And so I will let her share her um, chingonaness, verdad? Because that's exactly what it is. Did y'all notice that I just made up that word? It was really gorgeous. Trans I love it. Translanguaging, everybody. Translanguaging. I'm mobilizing uh, out of my linguistic repertoire. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask both of my guests to um, share a little bit about themselves. So he said, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, would you share a little bit about your background as well as um, your own personal experience and, and the communities that you serve? Claro que sí. Uh, primeramente, mucho gusto a todos. Thank you so much for being here um, in this space. Um, so, I am a currently a fourth grade dual language teacher in uh, the district of South uh, Berwyn District 100. Así que shout out to all of my colegas over there. Um, y también este, I've been in the dual language world since uh, we first started implementing, which I believe was somewhere in 2016. Uh, I was one of the first kinder, uh, one of the first dual language teachers to pilot the program when my kids were in kindergarten. And every year, you know, they kept going up the grade levels. Y ahora están, el año pasado estaban in fourth grade, and I got a chance to teach them again. So it was such a beautiful experience to be able to see my kids again in, uh, in the fourth grade uh, setting. And so I'm currently, ahí es donde estoy. My students are, they fit uh, mainly three, the three linguistic profiles. My students are, um, I have a lot of students that are, are, are Latinx Spanish uh, heritage speakers that um, are highly proficient in Spanglish and that can, um, they have a high uh, Spanish uh, receptive language and they have a lot of cultural background. También tengo uh, students, um, I had the privilege of working with uh, four students who had recently arrived from Mexico and they just enriched the classroom experience so much because it just, um, I just saw the authentic connections between the students um, that are, are Latinx students and the students that had arrived. And then I have also uh, a smaller group of students that are, they come from in, uh, English households. So they're learning as well um, with my students. Um, but I, I graduated from uh, UIC, and I want to say this because this is DACA related, in 2010. In 2010, I, um, I had my bachelor's, I was ready, but because in 2010 we had no DACA, I wasn't able to teach like the rest of my 
uh, counterparts. Um, so I had to wait, and that was a very that was a turning point, which I can discuss later. Um, and but uh, luckily, I was I had an opportunity to still continue my education, and I was in a master's program um, at UIC. And sure enough, during that time, uh, 2012 comes, DACA is implemented. And it was a turning point, and I was able to then uh, be hired at Emerson Elementary, where I'm at. Very nice. Thank you, Giselle. And um, after we chat with Abelardo, I, I want to touch upon, uh, upon DACA, obviously. And so we'll go a little bit into detail with that, because it's one of the reasons why we're here. So gracias for that. Mi compa, Abelardo, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your work. Who, who do you serve? ¿Cómo causas desmadre? ¿Qué onda? Well, first and foremost, uh, muchas gracias, compa. Gracias por la oportunidad y por la plataforma. And it is such an honor to be here, not only sharing uh, my experience, but uh, also to use this as a, an opportunity to keep learning, on learning, and relearning. So, ¿quién soy yo? Un inmigrante, Cuernavaca, Morelos, México. My name is Abelardo Almazán Vázquez. I currently teach uh, Spanish, advanced levels, at this independent boarding school in the state of Vermont. And that comes as a shock to many people because the question that I get most of the time is, what does a Mexican do in Vermont these days? I'm like, yeah, well, it's a long story, but the best way that I can summarize it, it's the institution where I work uh, has what I need to keep not only disrupting the spaces and disrupting the curriculum and uh, the narratives that um, are often really popular among world language teachers. But it allows me to not only create, but to take risks and to ask questions to my students. So it is a boarding school in Vermont. It's called the Putney School, Progressive Education, located almost in the middle of uh, nowhere in southern Vermont, really beautiful but also a great place for students and faculty to come in to ask very difficult questions these days, that we are not an institution that uh, does standardized testing, for example. We don't do AP Spanish, we don't do any of that, but we are really invested in project-based learning. Lots of asking questions, creating critical thinking opportunities, and that's why I really like uh, working here and I'm starting my year 10 here in Vermont. So before Vermont, uh, I arrived to the United States when I was offered an opportunity to study a master's degree in Cleveland. I studied my master's in Latin American studies at Cleveland State University. And I grew up in Mexico my entire, like all, all my high school experiences, my undergrad experiences were all in Mexico, in Cuernavaca. So a lot of the things that I've been working on these days are things that I'm learning constantly and how the curriculum changes so rapidly that it is only important for keep extending those invitations to my colleagues to keep questioning, to keep disrupting the spaces, echando desmadre, like you said, uh, beautifully in the NECFO conference, Jose, and I was like, oh my goodness, I've never felt so seen and validated. The, the time they use the word as madre, it's like, yeah, we're disrupting. We are disrupting, we are interrupting the spaces because we want to start shifting the conversations in a different direction. So that is a little bit of who I am, and I'm really grateful to be with everyone today. Thank you, Abelardo, and thank you, Hisel. I have to tell you that one of the reasons why I invited the two of you as well is because it's rare that three folks of color, um, three educators that usually don't have an opportunity to um, amplify ideas, ideologies and ideas, um, like that's something that we need more of. And I love that all of our friends um, that are diverse and joining us from all parts of the country um, understand the importance of amplifying the voices of Black, Indigenous um, educators of color. And so thank you for, for being here with me. So he said, one of the things that, um, that I really want to tackle and that I want teachers and administrators to tackle um, in whatever fashion or form school 
um, looks like in the fall when we return um, is DACA because many of us have been personally impacted and we know that our families that we serve and the students that we serve also are impacted um, in terms of DACA. And so if you could really share um, information in terms of what can we do, your own experience. I know some of the, the work that you've done at the national level. So I think that's really important for all of us to learn from. Okay, so I boy. <laughs> Ready. Um, I wanna talk about, um, I wanna talk about DACA advoca advocacy and you're so right. Um, the, and the issues of DACA, um, I think extend more than just DACA. Um, a lot of our students um, come from mixed status families. So that means that in a household, you can have a parent who, uh, well, to, you can have two undocumented parents, you can have a, one who has a DACA status and then you can have somebody who might have a humanitarian visa and then somebody who might be uh, a US citizen. And so um, oftentimes, you know, people might think that DACA is just something that impacts just, just the 800,000, but it's not. Um, and I can elaborate on that too. Uh, the other thing that I wanna make sure that, I, uh, that I'm able to share and discuss um, when it comes to at my advocacy work, I'm very uh, aware that my advocacy is self-advocacy and self-empowerment. Um, and I recognize the value of using our voice to tell our stories. Because when we tell our stories and we take ownership of that, what we're automatically doing is offering the society, our country, a counter narrative to the narrative that's been um, used and, uh, and, and, and criminalized and dehumanized by people in power that have absolutely no understanding of who we are and unfortunately and sadly do not really care about our livelihoods. And that, uh, the evidence of that is in the policies. And that's why I think it's so important for us to, to really get to know and to be aware of these policies and legislations um, because they really do impact families at the very, um, at the everyday level. So that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I, that I highlighted. Now, um, I started doing this kind of work in, or gaining consciousness about my, um, using my voice as, as a political tool. When uh, I was inspired in 2010, it was a, a very important time because during 2010, you started to hear um, undocumented youth, uh, young adults coming out of the shadows, como decíamos, undocumented and unafraid. And I clearly remember this one time when I was in college, uh, I sat in a round table con otros, otros jóvenes como yo, and the, the thing that they said was, my name is, and I am undocumented. And that was the first time that in a, set, in a public space, you were sharing your story. It was unheard of. So um, I was inspired by a group of students, uh, a young uh, uh, activists from Chicago. They were sharing their stories at the Federal Plaza in Chicago. And I didn't have a chance to go because I was in class. But I also wanted to be a part of that. So what I did was that I wrote a letter. It was basically, it was a letter documenting my experience, documenting what I had to say. And it, when I look back at that letter, it, it, it starts off in 2010 saying, um, at this moment, it was, sorry, the audience también eran my, my colegas who were also teacher candidates. And I was telling them that at this very moment, I had peers risking their lives and risking deportation for something important that they had to say. And then I start sharing my narrative and I start talking about how I came here to the United States when I was three years old and I had a visa, but then when my visa expired, so did my chance to fulfill my professional dream and so forth. Because I wanted people to understand as I went through my narrative I wanted, to, I wanted to highlight the important policies that were, um, that, were, that were in place. For example, I say I was an undocumented child in here in the United States, but nobody knew because there was already a Supreme Court case 
that was fought at, at the Supreme Court case in uh, se llamaba Plyler versus Doe in 1982. And that it allowed undocumented children to have access to free public education. Lo que quiere decir que prior to that, and because of the state laws, this, this happened, this court uh, case happened in, in, in Texas, um, there, was a, there, was, there was a law that was passed in Texas in 1975 that basically um, was not gonna allow uh, children who didn't have US birth certificate to have public education. They were a burden. And so they were asking families, districts were asking families to pay $1,000 per child for, ed for, for public education. So that was a matter that went to the Supreme Court. And at the time they ruled um, in favor of, uh, of the undocumented uh, children, not so much because they cared about us, but it was because they cared about uh, el orden de la sociedad, which meant that they were concerned that you were gonna have a group of children who were gonna be illiterate and then what are we gonna do with, the, with them? That's gonna be a bigger problem, right? So, um, so I think that, that, was, that, that, was, that, that was important to share in that narrative. And then um, I talk about, I kind of, uh, at the end, because they were my, my, my teacher, colegas, candidates, I, I, it was a, like a call to action. Um, at the time I had found out that I wasn't gonna be able to ap apply to become a resident through my mom's petition. Um, which meant that I wouldn't be under the current immigration system. I wouldn't be able to teach until like 17 years, according to the calculation of the state of, of the uh, immigration attorney. So I said, in that time, I really thought that I wasn't going to be able to teach. And I said, um, but you will. So I ask that you care for the children, that you, that you recognize that there are these systems that we don't know that what how they might impact our students and we have to be there right to to support them and so forth so that was the first time that i came out as an undocumented immigrant and after that i was invited um to different to different settings a lot of them were academic settings um a lot of them were with uh, social social workers people that were interested in that field college admissions people who came across undocumented adults in college, but had no idea or awareness of what their ex experiences was like. Um, I also got a chance to uh, um, share my story with uh, high school students, I'm in. And, um, and then there were other public spaces that I got a chance to, to share my, my story or my opinion in local Spanish and English, in English um, media outlets from TV to newspapers. And then um, another one was uh, directly writing to my Illinois senator, uh, who then shared my story at the Senate uh, floor on the fifth anniversary of DACA. Um, so that was a very important and meaningful experience because then I got to use that um, YouTube video to share it with my students. So that was, that was uh, an incredible experience I'm in. And then the one that I, can't believe I did, but I did it because it was the right thing to do because I needed to. Um, September 5th, 2017 was uh, a very devastating day for us because that was the day that the US State Attorney Jeff Session announced the termination of DACA. And for those of us that knew this was gonna impact our lives, I um, got a chance to uh, work with uh, documented DACA activists. And what we did was we set up a press release conference and a rally. So uh, I shared how I was feeling. Um, and that was at the, at the in, in La Plaza with a bunch of microphones and thousands of people on helicopters and all that. Um, and I was in the news and everything. <laughs> it was uh, very nerve wracking, but at the same time, very uh, empowering and liberating that uh, despite everything that was happening, that you have, uh, you have a say and that you're going to defend your rights and that people will know that. So that's been, um, and then I've also been a part of like scholarship committees and things. That was more of the work that I did um, when, I was, when I was in college. It was um, being involved with scholarship committees 
um, that would raise funding for undocumented students because they did not, well, we did not um, have access to state funding and scholarships like that. Um, awesome. He said, that's amazing. I want you to know that multiple times as you were speaking, um, I'm also looking at some of the faces of our participants as they're listening to you. I'm looking at the chat box and just know that for many of us, perhaps, um, finally we have a face to connect with um, a fellow educator. And so, especially for those of us in dual language and world language that so often talk about critical consciousness and sociocultural competence, but we do it at a performative level and that we've never actually taught a lesson on um, immigration or read a book or started a conversation, then perhaps now we understand the importance of why it needs to happen. And the fact that there are so many dual language and world language teachers that are like you and have had to engage in this constant struggle and fear. So thank you for sharing your testimonio. I, I really appreciate it. Abelardo, um, I know that you are an immigrant as many of us um, are, and our families are. Um, and I know that that definitely plays a role into the kind of educator that you are. So might you share a little bit about your testimonio and how that impacts the work that you've been doing in terms of decolonizing curriculum? Claro que sí, Jose. Um, before I get started, I want to do a, an exercise of checking my privilege. Checking my privilege has been constantly in my mind ever since I uh, became an educator for one big reason. The fact that I'm an immigrant doesn't mean that I should not be constantly checking at those things that are part of my identity that I'm still benefiting from or taking advantage from. For example, the big one, I'm a cisgender male heterosexual. And I have so many privileges within my identity that I can say I have two passports because I also became a US citizen in 2014 here in Vermont, so I'm able to travel or I don't have to worry about having to pick a restroom at a public space or I don't have to worry about the parts of my body that are still functioning or even that I'm tall for the standards of um, many people where I grew up, like that I'm actually tall. So that being said, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for role modeling what it means checking our privileges and starting conversations with our students. So when I share my story of how I came to the US, I was thinking a lot about those conversations where some people have said to me, why are you speaking Spanish in public? Go back to your country, speak English, this is America and all of that. And yeah, I mean, we in, in some ways have experienced that more or less, but it makes me think, do any of these people who yell at us for speaking a different language know what it's like to go through those expensive paperwork, the, the USCIS, the fees, changing your status, changing your like uh, adjustment of status, the I-20 forms and having to choose the right visa or how expensive it is to pay like uh, an attorney or those who are able to pay an attorney, those who have to rely on pro bono services. So those are really questions that in my mind are important to keep asking because these are not new. When I came here in 2004, the anti-immigrant rhetoric was probably as strong as it is right now. Those of you may remember Minutemen, the militia in Texas, in California, in Arizona. And they were supported by this uh, governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger in California. I remember that vividly because he was around 2004, 2006. And that was during the time um, when I was questioning, like what, what it's like to, to be an immigrant. Racial profiling is not new. Racial profiling has al also been constant. Like I remember, uh, Luis Gutierrez, the congressman, actually doing the uh, the game in front of the, the Congress. Like, uh, who is the immigrant here? Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez. So a lot of people say like, ah, oh, Justin Bieber, he's from Canada. Selena Gomez was born in Texas. She's an American citizen. 
So a lot of those conversations I feel are really important to just keep having because uh, to be an immigrant, it's a unique trait. It's not a monolith. Like when, when people hear the word immigrant, we should be thinking a lot more besides what the media is showing us, what the social media nowadays is displaying. And more recently, uh, the conversations around immigration have been really productive, productive because we're talking a, a lot about intersectional, intersectional immigration, we're talking about intercultural immigration and what it means to foster and to create a space where each story can be humanized and can be treated as a single story that is not always connected to what the media, what the TV, what the, some uh, people out there in positions of power and influence are trying to feed us. So that's how my conversations around immigration have been evolving and I've inserted this in my Spanish classes. So later on, I, I would like to share with uh, everyone an example of how I uh, disrupted the immigration component in, in, in a place where I took a risk. I took a risk, but I'm going to save that for a little bit later. So. Sure. Well, and actually, so the question has already come up. I mean, um, I'm, I'm reading some of the things that people are writing. Um, definitely, they want to know if the two of you have had an opportunity to share your testimonio and engage in this kind of conversation with the communities um, where you serve. Porque definitivamente, pues, es otro, es otro rollo. Este, tener que compartir en la comunidad en la cual que uno en, en la cual uno sirve verdad en el cual uno da apoyo and then the the question that that also is related to that is um, the the teachers really want to know obviously what does this look like in the pre K twelve setting um, I know that he said obviously you serve at the elementary level and Abelardo you serve at the secondary level so if we could move into that direction he said like how has this impacted specifically the work that you do in the classroom um, and with your community. And then we'll have the same question for Abelardo so that um, both of you get a chance to talk about like, how do we do this in the classroom? Because I'm sure that most people that logged on today are good people. Like we don't have the research to support that they're good people, but I'm, I'm amazed, you know, I'm assuming that they showed up, so we're good people. So what does it look like? All right, so I'm gonna try answering that question. Again, drawing from my, my perspective as both a teacher and a DACA recipient. Um, so my experiences with that, when, um, when all of this happened, um, actually not even on September 5th, 2017, which was the termination of DACA, but um, this happened in, after the elections of 2016. Um, I don't know, maybe folks can relate to, to my experience. Um, el miedo que se tuvo because of we've, we were already anticipating what that what the administration had planned so the agenda was pretty clear since the very beginning um what was in mind and i remember that day going to school and and having to visit my principal's office because i couldn't i was i no podía it was a very difficult experience um Something that I can say about that was I had a, because I had a good relationship with my principal, I feel like she was very um, understanding. Um, and so uh, that just reminds me about the importance of, of, of relationships, building those relationships. But I think that if I, you know, there's a, this is part of the whole being courageous because because when you're undocumented, you do not have a label that says you're undocumented. You look like everyone else. You have your Miss Escobedo, or you have a, you have a teacher title. Um, and then when these things happen, you're in a position where you're like, okay, so I have to tell my principal that I might not be able to be here in the classroom. And um, also, I want to mention that um, p parents, uh, parents, no sé cómo, honestly, maybe I don't know, maybe one of my colegas shared or something but i gotta tell you that i had one of my parents uh of my students come to me after class and she said um i know i i'm so sorry to hear this i know you're a daca recipient and i want you to know that please let me know what we can do 
to support you. And later on, we were at a at a local like church in a basement, and they were uh, talking, having these conversations about how to support undocumented immigrants in the community. And so I was a part of that because a part of that discussion because they really wanted to know um, how they can support. And so I think those are the moments where it just becomes uh, very real and very important to to engage in those conversations um, with the community and how the families kind of come together to support as well. Um, and then in terms of share, how to share this or with my with my students um, in kindergarten, I, I got to say that uh, the, the most uh, meaningful experiences that I had bringing immigration or these kinds of conversations into the classroom was very authentic. In kinder, uh, my, ki my kids were aware at the time, our, uh, our principal is that Beatriz Maldonado, she, uh, she was not going to be a principal there. So the kids heard and they're like, oh yeah, Mrs. Maldonado, she's going to be the principal. And somebody was like, who's going to be the principal? Is it going to be Donald Trump? And then somebody else was like, you mean Ronald McDonald? No, Donald, who's Donald Trump? And then they were talking about the wall and Quien Sabe Quien. So then during morning meeting, I remember bringing them and asking them questions like, what do you know about the wall? What is the wall? And, and they were like, the wall between Mexico. And but my tias are over there. Are they going to build, a, is he going to build a wall in Ohio? Because my grandfather is in Ohio. So they were just asking these questions and um and i think that uh, i think that again this is why it's important for us as teachers to to build critical consciousness so that we can um and awareness so that we can respond to the students as they're bringing these conversations especially when they're little um and the other the other thing that i did um in, in terms of bringing language identity into the classroom was i shared little clippets of like um when I was with Univision, you know, sharing an opinion or whatever, and it was in Spanish, and I was like, oh, what language am I speaking? Oh, you're speaking Spanish. Sí, porque en español y en inglés podemos hablar y podemos decir lo que, lo que, que, lo que, lo que pensamos que es importante, and so forth. So that was, that was really meaningful. Now, in fourth grade, it just, it was very, uh, again, it was also an, an authentic experience, morning meeting, we're building community, and, um, uh, we were talking about our, our voice, también. And so then I got a chance to show them uh, the, uh, my, like the doc, when Senator Durbin is on the Senate floor and he brings the big poster and he's talking about my experience and stuff. And they're like, they think that I'm like a, like a, like a Hollywood star or something. <laughs> and, uh, but the main thing that I told them is your, your voice matters. And you can do this. And um, the other thing, Jose, I want to I want to share this is during read alouds. I shared familia with the kids, and it was just a beautiful uh, experience um, to share this story. No sé si se puede ver. Of and, course, it's last la historia de Margarita. See, sí. and at, and just through images and what's written in the text, uh, um, encouraging students to ask questions about the role of el niño, like you can, uh, el, el señor, like what, what, um, what does this uniform mean? And what uh, to the community and things like, and just como dijo Abelardo, um, getting them to think critically. Um, I also had a chance to uh, read them a story, La Pequeña, I believe it's called La Pequeña Emigrante. In that story, um, there's an image, la niña está en, una, en un cage, basically. Y está también un agente de inmigración. You can't see his face, so kind of he's looking the other way. And in the middle, between the cage and the agente, you see this woman, and she's carrying a suitcase. Y tiene um, the ACLU, so she's like a like a legal representative, and she's like pointing at the immigration agent, and he's pissed. She's pissed, and she's the one who helps out. And I I point that to the students to say, like, what is the role of that attorney? And like, look, because she's bilingual and because she understands like she can make a difference you know so in those kinds of ways I've been able to kind of bring in um, uh, those experiences into the classroom but of course with good planning and having uh, thought partners we can totally engage in much deeper like I uh, tengo, uh, mucha, uh, I really want to engage with uh, now this is another <laughs> this is yours Jose social cultural competence and improve, to improve school culture, bringing in testimonials. If we're doing a unit on narratives, 
Why not personal narratives? Why not testimonials? These are the things that our students are gonna be connecting with. And it's very important that we give them those opportunities to be able to critically, uh, to see themselves and to be able to critically analyze their experiences. Yeah, thank you for that, he said. And, and I just want you to know that I did not ask he said at all to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. no. I'm looking at the comentarios over here. Um, just as an FYI, a lot of you are asking for the titles that, um, that she shared. And so we'll make sure um, that we include them in the, in the notes when I, re when I upload the video. But also the last question is really about resources. And so both Abelardo um, and he said we'll share more resources as well. Abelardo, please share. You, you kind of teased us. So I can't wait to hear exactly what the hell happened at the secondary level as you engaged um, your students in these types of conversations? Well, here's a little bit of a background. When I started to be louder in speaking about this conversations around immigration and uh, intersectionalities and the importance of uh, an intercultural setting where we foster not a culture that it's higher or lower, but culture that, that they're met at the, at the ground level, that they could be um, meeting uh, halfway. I remember this student who whispered behind my back, why can't we just learn Spanish for once? We're talking about a student who was probably frustrated because I was not the teacher who was conforming to the let's learn about grammar conjugations and let's conjugate verbs and the pronouns and all of that so i was like well parents weekend it's coming and your parents will be here and they are going to be watching a sample class so they're expecting this like you know fun class and we're going to be doing something like uh, interesting for for the day but what the parents and the students were not expecting was me playing a video of this band, La Santa Cecilia, Ice El Hielo. And for those of you who have watched that video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those of you who don't, Google it, YouTube, and you'll see, just imagine for a minute if you were a white parent or a white student, watching a video like that for the first time and making a point of translating the lyrics from that song. That's all I needed to set the tone and to start the conversation. We're talking about mid-level Spanish, like intermediate advanced. So with students, I was able to have a conversation right after the song ended. And of course, you could see their faces. You could see how like uh, some parents were crying. Some parents were like, but I was not going to give them the fun day, to be honest. I just saw an opportunity and I took it. And I also understood that it was risky. I acknowledged in that moment, and my parent told me like, maybe, maybe in other schools, if you had shown this, you would have been reprimanded, not here. And I think, it was a really good opportunity to set the tone for the rest of the year on how to use materials like this music video from La Santa Cecilia and also eventually using TV shows like Living Undocumented on Netflix, whose producer is Selena Gomez, by the way, speaking of Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber, um, or using TV shows like Gentified, Gentified, or One Day at a Time to start having those conversations and to ask questions. Because at the end of the day, it is extremely essential that we keep role modeling to our students, not what to think, but how to think by themselves. So that is the story. And I think I need to give a shout out to uh, someone that you know, Jose, really well, uh, Francois Stenu, who- Amiga Fran. Amiga Fran, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, She's been also doing this at the early uh, length, the earlier years, kinder and uh, at a primary level. 
So a lot of teachers keep telling me like, no, they're too little. They should not be given these materials to talk about this. No, I mean, there are plenty of teachers who are using all these concepts and they're facilitating wonderful uh, classes that go beyond the, um, what the teacher will say, like it's age appropriate. Yeah. And another shout out that I wanted to give real quick, it's uh, to another colleague, uh, Dori Conlon Perugini, who uh, has been an amazing advocate of what it means uh, to teach with uh, intercultural elements and resources these days in the world language classroom. Yeah, no, and definitely follow both of them on social media because both of them are really, really doing amazing work. And um, Fran, I, I'm hoping that I'm gonna have Fran at some point. Um, we've done some Instagram, uh, we did an Instagram live together um, and she's amazing and she's doing some of this work, just like he said, and Abelardo, um, doing it at that very young age as well. Um, so definitely somebody that you wanna follow. So a lot of the questions that are coming up are really about resources and um, things that you're able to share with them in terms of um, implementation in the classroom. So we'll move in that direction in just a moment. But for those of you that are dual language educators, Remember that for us, we actually have a system, a framework to do this work. Um, it's the goal of dual language, it's sociocultural competence. And so we do that through that culture learning target. And it doesn't matter if you're in pre-K um, or if you're facilitating instruction at the 12th grade, like we actually have an umbrella that allows us to engage in these conversations if we just own the three goals of dual language. But a lot of us have um, fooled ourselves into thinking that we are doing the sociocultural competence work by having a night where parents bring food or we read one article in for Hispanic Heritage Month. And if that's you, like wake the hell up because that is not dual language. Dual language is literally a program about disrupting a monolingual, monocultural, patriarchal, heteronormative way of living and breathing in schools. And so keeping that in mind is so important. So culture learning targets, gente, las tres metas de un programa dual. And I know that, um, Abelardo, for you and Actful, um, Actful is actually doing a, a lot of the same work because, I mean, they invited me to go cause this madre at Netful, um, and I've caused this madre at Actful before. So it, it, we have the same goals and, and we have the tools to really engage in that deep work. Um, so I know that the teachers are like, por favor, recursos, recursos. So, um, what are some stories or books or resources or tools, any kind of um, support that we can give our teachers um, at the secondary level, but also at the, um, at the elementary level um, to really get us started? And, and we'll also share books. I, I put a, a couple of slides with books as well, so you'll get that as well. We'll start with secondary this time. Um, Abelardo, algún tipo de recurso, algún material, este, ya hablo de los videos, de las canciones, pero tal vez un tipo de herramienta que tal vez para, para apoyar a los estudiantes sea de beneficio. Uh, the first book that comes to my mind is by Dr. Terry Osborne, a uh, really good book about uh, incorporating uh, themes of social justice in world language classroom. I highly recommend that book. Jerusha, yeah. if you could do me a favor, my friend Jerusha is here as Abelardo's chatting. Would you type it in the chat box? I, I'm only asking because um, we're best friends. Andale. Abelardo, can you repeat that one more time? I'm all asking for secretarial yeah. assistance over here. I'm so sorry, uh, Ms. Jerusha. Uh, don't have the exact title with me right now, but the author, Terry, Dr. Terry Osborne from University of South Florida, and the title is related to incorporating social justice uh, topics into the world language uh, setting. So that is one book that I uh, really believe uh, will make a good um, start. Um, someone wrote this in the chat, in the chat, and I, I was going to say that yes, I used that book also recently. Uh, Gloria Saldúa, Borderlands, La Frontera. That is probably my favorite book in terms of incorporating uh, inter the intersection of gender, race, uh, gender identity, and uh, what it means uh, to live in the border. What it means, uh, like Facundo Cabral sang beautifully, no soy de aquí, ni soy de allá. Sometimes that's how we feel in so many places when we're neither from here nor from there. Those of you who go back to your home countries may be relating to how you don't feel 
in my case, I don't feel like uh, too Mexican anymore, but I don't feel too American when I come back. And it's real. It's something that it is important to, uh, to keep validating and honoring in our students, the heritage language students, the dual language students, and those students who are from immigrant parents, uh, first, second generation, maybe going through that. So Borderland is probably one of the uh, books that I really enjoy um, reading. And finally, Notes of uh, Undocumented uh, Citizen by Jose Antonio Vargas. I really, really like that book. And don't get um, the idea that just because it's Jose Antonio Vargas, it sounds Latinx because he's Filipino. He's Filipino-American, undocumented. Founder of this wonderful organization called Define American. And you should also Google his um, video on YouTube on how Jose Antonio Vargas uh, shares his story when he found out the first time that he was undocumented. So that, that is one of the, the books that I really like using. and. I hope those help. I, I haven't read that last one, Abelardo, so um, I'm going to make sure that when, um, when I go over the recording and upload it and, and everything that I quickly um, purchase it from Amazon. So gracias, gracias for that. Um, and let's go ahead and go to my friend he said so that she could hook us up maybe with some books or resources for the elementary level folks in the space. Well, for elementary, like I said, like uh, La Pequeña Emigrante is a beautiful book um there's i gotta say jose your book was amazing so i recommend the books uh written by 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 you yeah. and you, know, you, you know i had to put a picture of course <laughs> there you go see and basically um i don't have at this moment a list of uh books but that's something that you know we can i can definitely y los demás si tienen también ideas. but i think the most important thing about about books is to always keep in mind like who the authors are because it matters who writes the stories and through what perspective so definitely that um and i do want to share another uh, resource but this is for um people that are interested educators that are interested that might work with undocumented uh high school uh, students high, and uh this is the book lives in limbo written by roberto gonzalez um you can follow roberto gonzalez on twitter too and he's a very well-known um researcher um he's currently at harvard university but um, his work is so extensive and it covers um, the ex a lot of the experiences of undocumented youth. Um, so I really recommend that book. I swear like when I was reading his book, I was, uh, it was like reading my life story, but it also gives you an opportunity, well, for at least for me, give me an opportunity to um, uh, provide a framework. And if, if teachers are, you know, uh, like if teachers are well aware then those those that's the kind of uh knowledge that they'll be able to then uh, help their, their undocumented youth kind of uh, be able to support them in trying to understand who they are as undocumented immigrants and there's also a uh, memoirs a uh, written uh, jose jose antonio vargas is another one um so definitely but those are resources for people that want to know more about the experiences of, of daca recipients no that's awesome thank you he said um, one of the things that our team did as uh, our team has done as we serve school districts throughout the country was definitely amplify the voices of immigrant communities. Um, thank you for giving a shout out to my books because as some of you that have um, served alongside me know that um, those testimonial books really about, are about the immigrant experience. I'm excited about the third book because the third book is uh, about the immigrant experience but through the eyes of an openly queer uh, boy who becomes an openly queer principal and teacher and so I am excited that we will have um, some bilingual resources to also talk about that intersection that both of you have mentioned because it's it's a different experience to bring those pieces of identity together um, this is another um, another place these two links also have resources on immigration including some spanish resources as well and then finally oops let me see here we go and then this one is another one that one of my one of the members of my team found 
Um, for those of you that are not following uh, Ms. Jerusha Hunt, um, who has been helping and treating some of the stuff, she too is a secondary teacher who is using um, testimonial work a lot and using the testimonial framework that is one of the tools that we use in dual language. Um, but she's doing that work with secondary students at the middle school level. So definitely um, follow her as well. Um, uh, before we go, because I know that the teachers want resources and, and that's what we're here to do, but we also want to um, amplify um, issues that need to be amplified. Um, presently, or one of the things that's um, on my mind is um, the Citizens Academy that is scheduled to um, be piloted in Chicago starting in September, where ICE is asking interested citizens to be trained on how to um, be trained on firearm use, how to detain uh, folks that they might deem as undocumented, which is just um, so scary. So um, I just wanted to close actually with that and, and get your thoughts on this kind of situation that continues to happen um, with this administration. And we, we can start with, um, with you, Abelardo, and close off with Hisen, and then we'll thank everyone for being here. But I thought that maybe a, a couple of sentences, just your thoughts each on this evolving story. <laughs> um, one thing that I would like to say that is really important is just because it's not happening here or where you, wherever you live, it does not mean that it's not happening. This is something that no matter how remote it could be or no matter where the bubble, where you work or where you live, if you're not speaking and condemning what's happening with this pilot in Chicago by this, uh, that this is basically something, uh, the continuation of Minutemen or the continuation of uh, racial profiling, the continuation of uh, the Arizona racial profiling law, the Alabama profiling law, like something like that. If you're not saying something, uh, just keep in mind what uh, what it means to be silent in the in the face of oppression. What it means to say nothing when you could be saying something in not only on your social media, but how do you implement this in your upcoming classes, pandemic or not? So I think those are my two cents, and it is important that we keep uh, disrupting the spaces. And I love that you mentioned, obviously, that it goes beyond liking a tweet. It's about how will you tackle this in your classes so that our kids are less of a mess than we are. So I love that. He said, you get the last word. What are you thinking and feeling as we um, thank our guests for, for coming and hanging out with yeah. the three of us? Um, I just want to remind everybody, um, and Abelardo said, it's reminded us that just if we don't uh, experience it, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And let me just highlight something that I remember seeing on, in social media when, um, when, when DACA Supreme, when, uh, during the DACA Supreme Court case and on in June, but this year it said, um, if your livelihood does not depend on a Supreme Court ruling, consider that a privilege, um, which means that these are things are, look, our communities are hurting. They're hurting. Um, I cannot believe that we are having, we're talking about a pilot, a program, a Citizens Academy that is grounded on racial profiling and, and violence. I mean, we have so much already. Our families are hurting. And what do we know about now with COVID and everything? That it is our familias that are being impacted the most. Because those are those are these are our families that have been left behind for for many many years desde el principio, <laughs> you know. Um, so I just want to make sure that that people remember that um, there's a lot of of these things that are happening that our children are experiencing, physical, mental, emotional, and we our students have a right to process and reflect and engage critically in these things. And we have a space for that in our classrooms. And the other thing that I want to just mention, um, again, drawing from this idea that, that we have a voice, our voices are powerful tools. So we have a voice to defend our right to be heard. We have a voice to courageously stand up for what we know is right. 
we have a, a voice to expose lies and hypocrisies. We can denounce hatred and bigotry. We can use our voice to tell people who we are, not what they think who we are. We can use our voice to document everything that's been undocumented. We can use our voice to, um, to also find commonal commonalities with other people's stories. And collectively, we can uh, build solidarity to strengthen our voices so that we can, um, so that we can uh, liberate ourselves from all of those internalized stereotypes and things that are, that are impacting us. So we have a lot that we can do with our voice, right? And I know through public, um, through personal experience that our voice matter. Now, if, if our voices matter, our students have a right to discover their voice. They have a right to develop and strengthen their voice. What we have to remember as teachers is that our educational system was not designed to have our students be heard. So it is our duty and responsibility not to save our kids, not, not that, but it is our duty and responsibility to amplify the voices of our students. But to do that, we have to be very intentional um, uh, to deconstruct and provide, uh, create anti-racist teaching and learning environments. And that's why I believe that this should be a priority um, because for those of us that are impacted by these things, this is not something that we can just leave in the bottom of our agendas. This is a need. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. <laughs> I mean, come on, shut up. Se votó, se aventó. I just adore the two of you and thank you so much. I'm so humbled that you would be willing to hang out with me and with these folks that, that gave up a part of their Friday, you both are so inspiring. And multiple times I've been chillando here in front of the computer. So thank you for all that you do. And thanks to all of you that showed up. Just know that, that we are so um, glad that you joined us today. Have a good fin de semana. Por favor, let your friends know it's gonna be um, uploaded onto YouTube this weekend so that if they didn't get a chance to see it, they get a chance to meet Abelardo and Gisela. I mean, come on. They should pay, really, to see the video because uh, Abelardo and Gisela are so good. Adios, everybody. Un abrazote. I adore you. Muchas gracias. Adios. Thank you so much. Los vidrios. Adios, adios, adios. Los vidrios. Gracias, Jose. Adios, adios. Gracias, un placer. Gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. A sus órdenes. Gracias. A la orden, a la orden. Increíble. Gracias. ¿Dónde va a poner los materiales? It, but, todo esto va a estar grabado, así es que en el, en el sitio de YouTube, ahí vamos a poner todo. Adiós, un abrazo. Gracias. 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 Cuídense mucho. Cuídense, cuídense. Gracias. 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 Gracias.